Good morning. I want to welcome everybody to worship here at St. Andrew's Community Church, where our mission is making disciples of Jesus Christ. It is good to see everyone here today. We're going to have a good surprise later in worship. Y'all got your attention now? Y'all just thinking it's this really cool looking shirt I'm wearing, but no. And we got a good, good, well, you just wait. You're, you're going to love it. So as we get started, I want to remind you that uh, this morning about 8.15, we had a group of about 20 students with some adult sponsors that took off for Memphis. They will be uh, doing some ministry through a group called Street Reach, and part of what they'll be doing this week is having vacation Bible school with a number of kids that they'll just do it in the park and everywhere else. I would have hoped that this week, as you think about them, that you would offer up a prayer for their health and their safety and the ministry that they are doing. Also, let me give you just a little bit of an update. Uh, I wish you had been, was it Tuesday, Wednesday? Mo it was Monday. <laughs> it, it was such a long time ago that I forgot already. I wish you could have been here Monday. If you'd have been here Monday, you could have joined me and Jeff and Sister Dubry as we were unloading the trucks for the new flooring that we will have in the worship center. Uh, along that line, uh, I want to tell you that uh, the carpet was easy to unload. The tile, well, that's why there's three pallets of it still sitting outside the front door. Help yourself, but you have to carry it by yourself. And I can trust you, or trust me, you don't want to do that. <laughs> it took J Jeff and I together to move one box, and we said, yeah, we're just going to leave it here on the porch. Um, but our, we're, the painting has started. The tile, we hope, starts getting put down this week. Things are, you know, starting to progress finally. We thank God for that. And uh, just want to let you know we're doing everything we can to make certain that we're back in our worship space by April 1st. We want to be back in time for Easter. So let you know that that is happening. Other opportunities we have for mission service, read about in your bulletin, through your mobile app on your smartphone or on our website. But let's get started because I know y'all want to know what this good thing is. So you got to sing loud. You got to sing like you mean it. You got to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. As you're able, would you stand as we begin to worship? Secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. Oh, 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in creation will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So one of the things that I suspect that you are aware of, I hope you're aware of because this is something we believe and preach and teach, is that whatever good thing we have in life, God is our source for those things. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. They're waving at me in the back. Children, hold on. I don't want you to miss something we're going to do in a minute, but thank you because I would have forgotten. (laughs) Every good and perfect gift we have comes from God. And you know last year our church made a decision for how we're going to affiliate denominationally to leave one denomination and become part of the global Methodist church. We did have to pay disaffiliation fees. In the midst of that, one of the things that we believed was that a lot of the money we had to pay would be paid out in escrow uh, and held, and maybe we would get some of that back. At the same time, we knew we could have just paid it all, but we didn't want to deplete all of our reserves, so we took out a loan to pay part of it. Well, we got word that probably the end of February we were going to get some of that money back. You know, my joke was every 100000 helps. <laughs> Uh, But I want to report to you this morning that uh, we have received and we have deposited and we have already sent to the bank the money we received over $200,000 back to help pay off our loan. Now, I have a sense that you're thinking, well, that's good news. Well, that's good news, but that's not the surprise I have for you this morning. You all ready for a surprise? So you you know, if you've been around, that every Christmas Eve, every Easter, our offering goes to missions, that we know that God has blessed us, and when God blesses us, we are meant to share those blessings. And our mission team meets to consider where is it that we want to distribute the money that God has blessed us with so that uh, we can be a blessing. Well, one of the groups that we learned about was a group called Positive Tomorrows. Uh, I learned about this last year. Carrie Guarnera, one of our members, was retiring from public education. And I said, what are you going to do in retirement? And she said, well, I'm going to minister at Positive Tomorrows. And I said, well, what's that? And she told me. And and we were just excited to learn about this. And so this morning, uh, we have a guest from Positive Tomorrows to come and tell you about what will be a mission for us. This is not a faith-based thing, but I'm going to tell you, when you hear about this, you're going to see a whole lot of Jesus and what they're doing. So, Brandon, if you would come on up. Would you all welcome Brandon from Positive Tomorrows? Thank you, Reverend Benny. Um, As he said, my name is Brandon Brooks, and I serve as the development director at Positive Tomorrows. 
As you see on the screen at Positive Tomorrows, our mission is to partner with families experiencing homelessness, uh, to educate their children, and create pathways for success. Right now in our community, between Oklahoma City Public Schools, Putnam City Public Schools, which is generally the area that we serve, there are nearly 5,000 students who are experiencing homelessness. Um, for the kids that we serve, that means um, half of our students are living in one of our communities for homeless shelters. 25% of the families that we're serving, they're living in transitional housing, which is they're getting some support to pay rent um, with an, agent, an organization like ours or some government assistance to help with their rent. And that's where we want most of our families to be on that pathway to stability. The last 25% of the families that we serve at Positive Tomorrows, uh, we put them in the broad category of being couch homeless. That means that they could be multiple families who are staying in a motel room, multiple families um, living in an apartment. Um, but these also this also includes families who are living in cars. We have kids who've experienced living in tents. Our goal at Positive Tomorrows is to remove the barriers that stand in the way of these kiddos getting an education. We transport our kids to and from school every day. We pick up from those shelters. We pick up from, um, we don't pick up from abandoned buildings, but wherever our families say they are, that's where we go and meet them. And that can change multiple times day to day, but we're committed to, to providing them a transfer, transportation to, to school. Once we get there, we feed them. We provide three meals a day to our students at Positive Tomorrows. A hot breakfast, a hot lunch, and a robust snack in the afternoon that for some of our kids just might serve as that last meal of the day. And then finally, we ensure that our students have all of the basic necessities they need um, to be a student, to be a kid. That could be shoes today, clothes tomorrow. Every single one of our kids on their very first day of school, whether it's our collective first day or the first day for them as we enroll students all year long, they're gonna be greeted with a backpack full of school supplies and everything that they need to be a student at Positive Tomorrows. We work with kids from birth all the way through sixth grade. And we're really excited that this coming fall we'll open a seventh grade classroom, broadening the, the cross section of the family unit that we can serve. We're providing a rich, robust education to our students. On average, our students show up to us one to two years behind academically and socially. So we're pouring into them to ensure that when they leave Positive Tomorrows, they're on track, ready to learn, on target. Now, while we're providing this rich and robust education to our students, we recognize that all of that work can be eroded if we are not also working to stabilize the family. So we have a whole social, social services team that's working with mom, working with dad to ensure they are overcoming their obstacles to give their kids and their family all that they need. Maybe it's a substance abuse issue. Maybe they're escaping domestic violence. We're going to wrap some support around them. We're helping them stabilize their housing situation. We're helping them become employable, increasing the income that they need, the critical income they need to support their entire family unit. Our goal, ultimately, ultimately at Positive Tomorrows, is to create a kiddo who's up to speed academically, socially, and eager and ready to learn. Mom, dad, family unit that's stable. Housing stable, financially stable. And then we have an entire family unit, right? Kids and parents alike that we can then transition back into a traditional school setting. Our belief is that education is critical to breaking generational cycles of poverty and hunger. We're uplifting families. We're walking alongside them. These aren't handouts. This is a hand along the way, right? And with your support and the support of so many people like you, we've been able to do this work for over 30 years. Our friend Carrie, she's a dedicated volunteer at Positive Tomorrows. I see her every week as she volunteers in our kindergarten classroom, as she mentors students. There are opportunities like that for groups and individuals to carry out the mission, right? There's a mission in the work that we do. And like Pastor Bennett said, we walk in faith every day. Um, we never know what we're going to encounter, but we know um, that there's support, there's physical, 
support in the flesh with people like you, but there's also some spiritual support that's guiding our work. And we're just so grateful um, to be affiliated with you, affiliated with this congregation. And I have an open invitation to anyone, anyone who wants to come and see the work that we're doing at Positive Tomorrows and find a way that you yourself or your family can walk, walk alongside of us, that's an open invitation. And Carrie can connect you to me and to my team, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you so very much. Hold on. Uh, so I have a few questions for you, a little Q&A. Um, the, the hotels that you pick them up for, we're not talking embassy suites. No, sir, not at all. Uh, the Oklahoman did a report a couple of years ago about crime in our community. And they identified four motels that accounted for 15% of the 911 calls in Oklahoma City. We pick up from two of those daily. And so if I'm, I'm living in this hotel, or worst case scenario, a car, a tent, how do I get clean? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, something that we did, we, we moved into, uh, we built through the generosity of the community, a wonderful new um, school moved into in December of 2019. Then just a few few months later, we were out of that school due to COVID. Um, but we very quickly were able to get back in there. Something that we did in our schools that we actually have two showered restrooms in our school. Um, we recently had a family that we've been working very closely with, unbeknownst to us, was living in their car and had been for almost a year. And as we were working with that mom and her three kids to get them what they needed, um, that mom could simply call her case manager our case on our staff and schedule some time to come and take a shower. And we work also collaboratively with other organizations in the community to help as quickly and, and as efficiently as possible get families from situations like that where they're living in cars into a shelter. Right? And, and, and y'all also have laundry facilities, I believe. So yes, sir, we have four sets of washers and dryers throughout the school. Um, anyone who's worked in education especially elementary education, re recognizes there are a lot of things can happen throughout the school day um, that may require uh, <laughs> some laundry. But for us, you know, that's, that's just accidents at the school. It could be a kiddo who shows up to school in the morning with soiled clothes because their parents don't have access or regular access to a washer and dryer. We can take that kiddo, take him to our clothing closet. He, she can pick out new clothes. We'll take their soiled clothes, wash them, and package them up to send them back home with them. Um, if mom or dad needs to bring a load, again, we have that available to our families as well. And, and one last question. Uh, you know, again, you're sleeping in your car. You're sleeping in a hotel that probably is a high traffic area. You're sleeping in a tent. Kind of hard to get rest. What? Yeah. How do you all bless students that way? Sure, that, that's absolutely right. And for anyone who's ever toured a, a shelter for those experiencing homeless, you'll recognize very quickly that you might not find it comfortable enough to sleep yourself, right? Some of them are very loud and noisy. Um, you know, it's a situation like you have cots just in a gym like this, and it's difficult to sleep. Um, and so we recognize that our kids can come um, to school very tired. Our commitment is to meet our kiddos where they are. As they show up through the doors, we're going to give them what they need. For many of our kids, it's simply rest. And so we have, um, you know, cots. We have little sleeping stations. If our kiddos are just simply tired uh, because the shelter is noisy, they can take a nap. Um, we don't, we're not punitive. We're not punishing our kids. We give our kids what they need. All right. Y'all like that? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So... In our uh, missions committee, we asked Carrie to come and make a presentation, and somebody asked the question. They said, well, how much does it cost to sponsor a child for a year? Because obviously none of this happens without support. And she looked through her file, and she said, well, it's $5,000 a semester. And so on behalf of our church, we would love to sponsor one child for a full year, $10,000 for positive tomorrow. Thank you so very much. Bless you. Thank you so very much. Bless you. Thank you. We're grateful, deep, deeply grateful to your congregation, your missions committee. And again, I welcome, it's open invitation. Um, come see the work. Come see your resources in action. Um, we're grateful for your support. Thank you. All right. Okay, so children, y'all can leave now. <laughs> and uh, the rest of us, 
God is our source. Amen? Amen. We have two giving stations in the front, one over on the side. We invite you to worship the Lord with God's tithe and our offering. You are invited to come. As we prepare our hearts to go to the Lord in prayer, you'll see on the screen behind me names of folks that we're praying for. Some have been there a while. Others uh, are new names that uh, we're lifting in prayer uh, as their church family. Uh, it's likely that you have concerns on your heart today. I encourage you to take those to the Lord in prayer. He's just ready to hear from you and uh, will meet those needs. We also, like D.A. said, want to remember those uh, local missionaries, but also our own missionaries who left this morning uh, to go to Memphis, a group of students and leaders, and we want to continue to pray for them this week. We had the joy of celebrating new life this week within the church. A baby was born, and we want to uh, continue to lift in prayer those that are awaiting the birth of uh, a new baby. So if you would, bow your head, please. Gracious and loving God, thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the springtime. Thank you for calling us to this place. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us to minister and to care for those in our community. Pray that you will continue to bless us. Lord, I thank you that we are able to partner with other organizations and to make a difference. Thank you for the, that gift. 
Lord, we pray for those who are on our prayer list for so many unknown reasons to us, yet you know every detail. Lord, I pray for healing and restoration and resources. Thank you for the families that are waiting on new birth. Thank you for the pain family that celebrated new life within their home this week. Lord, I pray that you will meet the needs of those missionaries that we support locally and some on the other side of the world. And God, we especially bring before you this morning our students and the leaders on their way to Memphis to minister to children in the streets and in the parks there. I pray, God, that you will put your guarding angels around them. I pray that you will provide travel mercy. I pray that you will provide safety. I pray, God, that they will come back with great stories to tell. Some just funny stories that that are going to happen when get together with a group of friends, but most importantly, those stories of transformed hearts and lives. I pray, God, that you will use our students and that you will bless them abundantly. I pray for the families that, that stayed home. I pray that you will bring peace to them, that they will know that you are protecting and guarding their family members. Thank you for the mission and the ministries within our church here. Pray that you will continue to guide and direct us. Lord, I pray for D.A. now as he brings us a message that you've placed on his heart. I pray that you will anoint him bless him. I pray you will open our ears and our hearts. I pray that the Holy Spirit will just come down now and be upon us. Father, I thank you for your son Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My grandfather, D. Young, was a farmer. Wheat, cotton, soybeans. Give him a you know, pair of bib overalls and a John Deere tractor. He's going to be busy all day. Y'all understand what I'm saying? For better or worse, the farming gene did not make it into my DNA. I don't know if that's because I've lived most of my life in the, the cities, but it's just you know, not a part of my story, but I do know enough about farming to know it's not nearly what a lot of city folks think it is. For example, I've, I've had people saying, you know, being a farmer is easy. You know, you, you plow the ground, you plant the seed, then you just pray for rain and good weather until the harvest comes and you bring in the harvest. And in that waiting period, when you're praying for rain, you're just sitting on your porch in your rocking chair drinking a glass of sweet tea, and that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. We know better, don't we? I mean, there's a big difference between plowing the South 40 and rototilling a 20 by 20 patch of your backyard. There's a, a big difference between fertilizing a quarter section and putting a little fish oil in your rose bushes so they grow better. And I don't know if, if any of y'all have ever had vegetable gardens at home. We've done that a few times, but I, I don't know what they're called. I call them squash bugs because if you're growing squash or zucchini, these predators, they just seem to invade your fruit, and you, you've got to 
get some dust to put on them. It's a lot easier work than fertilizing a whole field or, or having your field crop dusted or something. My mother grew up on that farm. She was born on that farm, two miles of downtown Tipton. I'm sure all of y'all know where that is. And some of y'all grew up on farms in Oklahoma or Kansas or maybe in Texas. So one of the things I remember about farming that my grandfather told me is there's always work to do on the farm. And there's not any waiting where you're sitting on a porch in your rocking chair. There's always work to do on the farm. And when we think about this, this teaching that Jesus gives us about the gardener and the grapevine and all that goes on there, one of the things that stands out, it's, it's not lost on me, is the grapevine, the gardener, the vine dresser, however you want to call them by, they do all the work by hand. They don't have a tractor, they don't have a combine, they don't have that kind of machinery that they're using. They're doing everything that they can by hand. And, and Jesus is talking about this the night before he dies, just a few hours before he's crucified. And there's so much for us to gain from this. Let's read a few verses from John 15 once again. I am the true grapevine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. So, without a doubt, the essence of this scripture is talking about a relationship. This whole illustration of the grapevine and the gardener is about a relationship between God and people. You see, God is the gardener. Jesus is the grapevine, but we are the branches off that vine. In other words, the only way that we have a relationship with the gardener is through the vine. The only way we have a relationship with God is through Jesus and what he has done. God, as the gardener, as the vine dresser, if you will, knows that there is always work to do. In the same way that my grandfather said, there's always work to do on the farm. There's always work that God is doing in our lives. In fact, the work that God wants to do actually starts before we ever even know who God is. That God is already pursuing a relationship with us. And in that moment, when we come to the recognition of who God is and the grace that God offers us, and we profess our faith and we say, I want to be a disciple of Jesus, well, then <laughs> some work begins in earnest. One thing I know about weeds on a farm, again, I didn't get the farming gene in my DNA, but one thing I know about weeds is the only way to kill a weed is to get it out by what? The root. And John Wesley said that the work of the Spirit in the life of a believer is to root the sin out of our lives. Now, in this grapevine, I appreciated so much about what Josh shared last week. And he said, when you read this scripture, and we didn't read the entirety of it, he said it mentions four types of fruit, and, and, and if you will, these are categories that we must consider, you know, where does this represent my life? If, if, if I need to be a fruitful Christian, where does this represent my life? And the first category was no fruit. Your life isn't, doesn't bear any fruit. You're not doing anything to somehow share the good news of the gospel or the, the, the work God's trying to do in you, you're not partnering with God to do that. You're not bearing any fruit. The second category was some fruit. The third category was more fruit. And the fourth category was much fruit. And that's where we all hope to be. We hope to be in a place of spiritual maturity where we are becoming more and more like who Jesus is. But again, the interesting thing is it doesn't matter which category you're in. You're going to get pruned. And the pruning is always to make us more fruitful than we were 
before. I hope when you look at your lives and you examine, you know, where am I in relationship to Christ, I hope that today you can say, you know what, my life is more fruitful than it was five years ago or ten years ago. And at the same time, you would know, should God give you breath in your lungs and your heart beating that long, that your life will be even more fruitful in five years than it is today. That's what the pruning process is about. But in the scripture that we read, it says something else that Jesus does in the life of a believer. When he's talking to his disciples, he's telling them, you have already been pruned and you have already been purified. Okay. So what does it mean to be purified? What, what is the sense of, of, of how that happens in our lives? Well, Jesus said you've been purified by the message that I give you. And one of the things that we most certainly would know about the culture that we have and the world that we live in is there are a lot of messages out there. There's a lot of messages trying to tell us, here's what your values should be, here's what your beliefs should be, here are the standards that you should live by. And so when I think of being purified, one of the things I find myself thinking is the branches get their nourishment from the vine. And if they don't get it from the vine, they're getting it from somewhere else. And so any fruit that it bears is bad fruit but mostly it's going to be fruitless. You remember Josh talked, if you were here last week, you'll remember. If you weren't here, don't worry, I'm getting ready to explain. <laughs> that a, a grapevine, unlike a tree or unlike a shrub, is not strong enough to grow upward. It grows out. If you're driving by a vineyard, you can tell it's a vineyard because there's some kind of trellis that the vine is attached to to help support the vine and give it the strength that it needs. But Josh pointed out to us that if a vine is not attached to something that helps it grow up, it grows out. And when it grows out, the branches begin to put roots down into the soil. And at that point, they begin to get their nourishment from the soil instead of from the vine. So if we are not getting our nourishment from the vine, if we're not getting our nourishment from the message that Jesus has given, we must be getting our nourishment from somewhere else, from the soil. I would tell you our nourishment needs to come from the word, not from the world. The world will make you all kind of promises that so seldom is it ever able to deliver on, but every promise that God has made we find comes true because of who Jesus is. The message he speaks is a message that sometimes is easy to understand and sometimes it's confusing, but it is always life-giving. We can't say that about the messages we hear in the world. I want you to consider a man by the name, I'm going to call him Jim. Jim didn't grow up in a church. In fact, he grew up in a home where his dad was a, a smoking, drinking, cussing, brawling kind of man. And that's what Jim believed a man was. That you smoke, you drink, you fight, you cuss, you, you know, just not a, a good role model. Jim was bigger than his friends. And he began to run with the older crowd, and, and they just kind of nurtured some wildness within him. And the values, the messages that he heard were messages like, I decide for myself what is right and what is wrong, or it's only illegal <laughs> if you get caught. And he did, and he went to prison. And while he was in prison, everybody knew, you don't mess around with Jim. Now, there was another guy that knew Jim's story. I'm going to call him Bill. Bill was a short little old guy. He was retired. He would tell you that when Jesus saved him, Jesus saved all of him, not just part of him. And because of that, he couldn't wait to tell people about Jesus, he just had a passion for doing that. But the mission field that he was gifted in and called to was inaccessible to most of us. Bill loved going into the prisons to tell people about Jesus. He knew they weren't in there because they were singing in the choir. They were there because they had done something wrong, and they needed the message of the good news that comes through Jesus. And so it was that as Bill 
uh, would go to the prison. He would, he would meet him in the visitor center and talk to him. And, and after the warden was comfortable, he'd let Bill go out in the yard and, and interact with the inmates and tell them about Jesus. And, and he kind of had access wherever he wanted to go in the prison. But the other inmates warned him, <laughs> don't go near Jim. I mean, Bill was attracted to the worst among them, and Jim certainly seemed like the worst. Don't, don't get near him. If you get near him, he's going to hurt you. One day, Bill's at the prison, and he's walking in an area that was kind of remote, finds himself in a hallway, door shuts behind him, and all of a sudden, here comes Jim the other way. Immediately, he realizes this could go very badly. He begins to look around for, is there another door I can go out? Is there another place I can go? Is, if, if I scream, is anybody going to be able to hear me? And I guess in his nervousness, Jim could see what was going on in Bill, and so he told him, he said, hey, don't worry. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm sure that offered some comfort, but you just wonder how much. And so it was that Bill knew he needed to say something. He didn't even remember what he said, but he, he said something, and that's when Jim said, I just want to ask you. I hear what you tell the other guys. I need to know if it's true. Is it really true that it doesn't matter what anyone does in their life, that God still loves them? I need to know if it's true. Does Jesus really forgive every sin we've ever committed? I need you to tell me if this is real. Bill looked at him and he said, absolutely, it's, it's real. God has loved you since the day you were born to this moment, and God's always going to love you. We said that a while ago, didn't we? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Jim, it doesn't matter what you've done in your life. God's mercy is greater than your sin. God forgives everything you do. What message purifies your life? Is it the message the world gives you that this is what you do and this is how you live because this will make you healthy and this will make you happy and this will make you wealthy and it will increase your sex appeal? Or do you believe in the word of God that says it is by the stripes of Jesus that we are healed and every iniquity we have ever committed is forgiven? Beloved, I, I, I say this frequently, and, and I trust that, that most of you would agree with me, but I want us to understand there is never a moment in our lives that God loves us any more or any less than he loves us in this moment right now. That's good news. It doesn't matter what we've done. He doesn't quit loving us. It doesn't matter how evil we've been. He always forgives us when we ask. That is a message that purifies your life. And on the night before he's going to die, Jesus wants the disciples to know, you have already been purified through the message I have given. Brothers and sisters, we are purified through the message that we hear of the good news that the blood of Christ not only forgives all our sin, it cleanses us of all unrighteousness. It grabs that weed by the root and yanks it out of our hearts. Come on, people, I told you this is good news today. Y'all ought to be a little more excited about that. Y'all act like y'all have heard this before. But one of the things about Jesus' message, again, typically kind of easy, but when you read the Gospels, so many times when he talked to the disciples, they didn't get it, which we appreciate because we're not alone then. <laughs> Those that knew him didn't always get it and and sometimes what jesus said was confusing and, and 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 this is the amazing thing about this the messages that jesus came to purify their lives from were not just the messages from the world some of them were from the community of faith now let that sink in just a moment because jesus would tell them you have heard it said but i say to you 
You've heard that it was said, <laughs> you know, it's all right to cuss and drink, smoke and chew and brawl with your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy. Pray for your enemy. You've heard it said you shouldn't commit adultery. But I tell you, if you look at another person with lust in your heart, you have committed adultery. The word that Jesus gave was different from what they had typically heard and understood. And it's what we describe today as the difference between the message of grace and the message of law. Our lives, our salvation comes because of grace, not because of law. Now, when I'm talking about the law, what I'm talking about is, you know, the, the, the Ten Commandments, the, the, the precepts, the rules of, of here's the things you should do and here's the things you shouldn't do. That's what we're talking about with the law. And unfortunately, people in Jesus' time had the understanding that if I just do the things I'm supposed to do and I avoid the things I'm not supposed to do, then I will receive salvation. And that is not accurate. It is only by grace that we receive the promised salvation of us. Now, that's not to say the law is not important. You know, we read the Psalms, and the psalmists say, I love the law. The law is helpful for me. I liken it like this. If salvation is at the top of the mountain, we all want to get to the top of the mountain. And if you've ever driven in the mountain, you know there are some times that you've got mountain going straight up on one side and mountain going straight down on the other. Y'all driven these roads before? And what you are really hoping for in that situation is a guardrail. That should you lose turn, you know, you're going too fast and you're missing your turn, that guardrail keeps you from falling off. That's what the law does. The law keeps us safe. It keeps us in a boundary to help us arrive to the place where we hope to get. And if somebody is teaching a gospel other than that, they are teaching a toxic gospel. That's a strong word, isn't it? Toxic. And I use it on purpose. There's some sometimes the messages in the church can be toxic to our understanding of how we're supposed to live. There was a book written several years ago. I never read it. But I love the title. It was called Spiritual Detox. I, it was just an interesting title to me. Maybe it's a good book. I don't know. But it got me thinking when I remembered this idea that if we're trying to find salvation by the law, that is toxic way to believe. What do we need for a spiritual detox? Well, like so many other things in our lives, how we experience some things in life often translates into some kind of spiritual principle that we can adhere to. So I was asking myself, how can you have a spiritual detox? And I began to think of the different ways people try to experience a detox in their body. Now, I'm going to share some things. I don't know if you have tried any of these things. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've done this, okay? I may ask you to raise your hand if you've heard of this, but I really don't want to know, especially this first one, if you've done this because it might be embarrassing. <laughs> but I have heard, I actually did research on this this week to make sure it wasn't something that I was just making up in my mind. Have you ever heard that one of the ways that you get toxins out of your body is to take an onion, a white onion, a yellow onion, I don't know, maybe a red onion, maybe a Vidalia sweet onion, but you get an onion and you slice the onion and you put it on your foot and you pull your sock over to hold the onion in place and you sleep with an onion on your foot. Have y'all heard of that before? Okay, so th this is actually a thing that people do. And <laughs> allegedly, when you wake up in the morning, that onion is going to be black because it's pulling all the toxins out of your body. Now, that's all I've ever heard, but I did read this week that a lot of people think that that is a good remedy if you have a common cold or the flu, sleep with onions in your socks, um, Kind of makes me wonder what people did during COVID if they've got that. You know what I'm saying? It just so it's it's a weird thing. But my research did say there's no medical evidence that that actually works at all. So if you've done it, I don't want to embarrass you by asking you to raise your hand. But from your laughter, either you've never heard of this, or you're thinking, "Oh boy, yeah, that was me." <laughs> and then we have these uh, 
detox diets. Have you ever heard someone say that, uh, I'm having a cleansing right now? Don't raise your hand if you've done it. I don't want to know that. <laughs> Although I know many of you have had a cleansing, the same cleansing I had just before my colonoscopy. <laughs> Those of you that aren't laughing, your time is coming. <laughs> and we will laugh at you then. But it, it's like we, we, we know things that we eat. We know that, that foods we eat have preservatives and, and all this stuff, and it gets in us, and we, we want to get these toxins out so our bodies can be healthy. So people do these detox diets where that, you know, it, it hopes to get contamination out of their body or it hopes to help them lose weight. And, 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 and these diets, you know, they're going to have laxatives and diuretics and, you know, minerals and vitamins and teas you got to drink and, and all this stuff to, to get you clean. I would never do one of those things because every one I've seen, every friend I've had, they show me what they're drinking and it looks like they mowed the lawn and just poured it in a glass of water, blended it up. I don't need to do that. And if you have done that and it worked for you, God bless you. I'm glad that it worked for you. I, I don't know how because here's what I read in a medical journal. It says, there is no evidence to support the use of these diets for the purpose of toxin elimination or sustainable weight loss. I got a nutritionist watching me real close, so I got to be careful here. Detox diets don't do anything your body can't naturally do on its own. The law can't do anything for you that grace has not already done. Mm, that's a good word. That if I want my life to be purified, it doesn't get purified by me living a sinless life. It gets purified by the grace of God, which becomes my motivation to live a sinless life. I don't keep the law because it saves me. I keep the law because it expresses my love for God and how God wants me to live as part of someone who is connected to the vine. Remain in me. Let my word remain in you. This is how we get purified. But I want to clear up one question that someone might have. In fact, after the last service, someone came up and they said, I'm glad you said that because I was really wondering. And here's the thing. When that grapevine is spreading out and the branches begin to put roots in the ground, remember, now the branches are getting their nourishment from the ground instead of from the vine. But here's the confusing thing. The vine is also rooted in that same ground. Have y'all thought of this already? What's the difference between a branch getting nourishment from a vine that is rooted in the very ground that the branch is trying to put roots down in? I did a lot of research on that. It hadn't been researched very much. But here's my conclusion. There's something about the vine that filters the toxins from the soil so that the nourishment the branch needs comes from the vine. That Jesus is a filter to get rid of the impurities in our life. Probably a lot of you are like me. You've got in your refrigerator door, you get your water out of there, but you know you've got a filter to get out the lead and other contaminants that come in water, or you've got a fuel filter in your car or an oil filter in your car so that the impurities don't get into your engine and ruin your engine. See, this is what Jesus is like. He is guarding us. He is protecting us. He is trying to draw all the things out of our lives that don't need to be there, but he's trying to keep those things from getting in us. And that's why he wants us to listen to his word and his message. Talking to Brandon before the service, I, I told him, I said, man, I'm just so excited to hear about what you're doing at Positive Tomorrow's. I know it's not a faith-based mission. He goes, we're not faith-based. I said, yeah, but I see a lot of Jesus in what you're doing. And he said, trust me, there's a lot of Jesus going on 
positive tomorrow. Is there a lot of Jesus going on inside of that? It doesn't matter if you got no fruit or you got much fruit. You're going to be pruned. But in that process, we begin to get purified. Because the goal Jesus has for us is to get to the top of that mountain and to become spiritually mature people is part of the journey. It's not always easy. Pruning's never fun. Neither was that colonoscopy. <laughs> but boy, did I look great when I came out. All that stuff was out of me. And Jesus wants to get all the stuff out of us so that we look more like him. He is the vine. We are the branches. Let us pray. Lord God, it's so good to be here today. So good that we can come together and worship. So good that we can share in something like positive tomorrow that if there's some child out there, oh God, that doesn't have a place to live, doesn't always have food to eat. And you tell us, oh God, that whenever we clothe those that don't have clothing and we visit those that are sick and we give drink to those thirsty or feed those that are hungry, that, that we're not just doing it to them, we're doing it to you. And just like those recipients of the gift, God, we know that our positive tomorrow only comes because of the grace that you give us. We thank you, O oh God, that your word purifies our lives. So we offer this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're able, would you stand as we sing? Jesus came. 
Friends, again, I am so glad that we had an opportunity to worship together today. I hope you are glad that you were here. Go in peace.